Hi, everyone. My name is Liza Wheel, and I am the founder of Gatehouse Admissions, and I am delighted to be here with you. A big thanks to GMAT Club for hosting today's event. Today, we are going to talk about Wharton, who should apply and how to get in. So with that, we're going to jump in to the presentation. All right, so before we do though, I'm gonna tell you just a touch more about who's talking to you today. And first off, I wanna say, it's really exciting for me to be back with GMAT Club. I've done, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen of presentations with GMAT Club over the years, and it's always great fun um, and just a wealth of resource. So I'm glad to the folks that are here watching this today, and I encourage you to check out GMAT's, uh, GMAT Club's YouTube Club, YouTube channel for more resources. Um, I've got some up there too, so check them out. Anyway, as I mentioned, my name is Liza Wheel and I'm the founder of Gatehouse Admissions. Um, I am actually, I did my MBA at MIT Sloan. I had just an amazing time there. Um, I started my career at Bain and & Company and it was actually at Bain & Company almost two decades ago um, when I started advising people on the application process to business school. And I've been doing it ever since. It's been really, really exciting to help people take the same journey that I did, obviously in very different paths and coming from different places, going to different places, but just that um, the journey itself and getting that opportunity to spend um, two years of your life at business school, it's tremendously rewarding and one that I just love, love helping people achieve. Um, I wanna tell you just a touch about Gatehouse, just so you know um, a little bit more about my experience. Gatehouse is a small team of, there. everybody on the team is, um, is an MBA, an MBA from Wharton, what we'll be talking about today, Harvard Business School or Stanford. Um, and we do have a few folks on the team that are ex-admissions officers actually from Harvard Business School as well. We are all super committed to helping people achieve their dreams of business school. And we really are targeted on those top schools. Um, so that's in part why I'm here today to talk to you more about Warden. So with that, let's jump into the good stuff and I'll tell you what we're gonna talk about today. I wanna to talk to you first, I wanna to talk to you about really the perks of Warden, as I call it. Um, a lot of this, this presentation is designed to help you think about whether or not Warden might be a good fit for you. Um, so I wanna share with you some, I guess, uh, stereotypes about Wharton. I want to debunk them. And then I want to tell you why I think Wharton's such a great school. But then once I've made you fall in love with Wharton and decide you must apply, I want to tackle some of the harder stuff, how it is you actually think about the application. We're going to focus on those two essay questions that Wharton at least traditionally has asked. And then we're going to talk about uh, Wharton's interview format, the team-based discussion. Um, I'll leave you with some next steps so you know what to do. And then we'll jump into q and I'm going to do my best. I already know I'm talking fast. I'm going to continue to talk fast because that's my nature. Um, I'm going to try to be done with the presentation in about 35 minutes, and that will give us ample time for questions. So please include your questions um, in, the, uh, in the chat box as we go along, and I will be sure to field those at the end. All right. So the perks of Wharton. So this part was really important to me because... You know, as I said, I got my M MBA at MIT Sloan, um, and you only do your MBA at one school. So invariably, when you come into this process, um, certainly as an admissions coach, you can't help but think a lot about your experience. You don't necessarily know about the other schools as much at the very beginning, and maybe you make some judgment calls. And it bothers me now, but I made or I assumed the stereotypes that I had heard about Wharton were true. Um, and pretty soon, again, I've been doing this for almost two decades, so it didn't happen, it happened long ago where I started to realize how much more Wharton really had to offer. That's one of the reasons I'm particularly excited to share this presentation with you because it, it it's kind of captures my own evolution of the strengths of the program. And a lot of it is just hearing this stuff from my former clients, my former clients who were there who say, oh my gosh, I mean, I, I got one text from a client there, I checked in with her, in uh, September after she'd started and I got a text back, oh my gosh, I can't imagine a better place for me. It's just magical. I think she literally used the word magical. So anyway, let's talk about the perks of Wharton. And I'd like to start with um, truth versus fiction. And I uh, imagine you have heard some of these things that Wharton is only for finance. I'm not interested in finance, so I shouldn't be going to Wharton. 
Um, or if, you know, on the flip side, but we won't, we won't deal with this as much. I'm only interested in finance, so therefore I must go to Wharton. But really, there's this assumption that all Wharton knows is finance. We'll talk through that a little bit. I've also heard that it's really super competitive, that everybody, it's a little dog-eat-dog -dog world. Um, it's every man for himself, every woman for herself. It's really cutthroat, um, and people are very inward-focused. That's another thing I heard a lot. And I think this may or may not fall in line a little bit with the only finance comment, but there's sort of the, also this assumption that it's it's stodgy. It's not that innovative. I don't know if any of you have heard these rumblings about Wharton, but if I do anything in this presentation, it's to make you realize that these are falsehoods that you should just put out of your out of your mind um, and do your research and really get to the, know the program for yourself. That is the journey that I went on when I started coaching people in the application process, and I was delighted with what I found. So, oops, okay. So let's talk about finance. Okay. So yes, the truth is that Wharton is very strong in finance. It, it, it really is a great spot for aspiring investment bankers or investors, whether it's buyout or PE or venture capital. It, um, I think it boasts, it's like one of the oldest, oldest finance programs in the world, um, at least for executive or, or master's level education. Um, so it is, it's, it's, it's hallmark, the, the Wharton hallmark really is rooted in finance. That's all true. Um, but put that aside and think about what else Wharton offers. And this is where I think it's really kind of exciting. So Wharton has 18 different concentrations available and, and majors, ways that you can really specialize during your two years at Wharton. And they run the gamut, everything from business economics and public policy. So people that are interested in you know, this really growing space of public private partnerships when it comes to infrastructure development. Um, it, you know, that's a big way, uh, things like airports and um, roadways and things like that, where it's both the public and private investments. It's a great space, a great major for that. They also have business energy, environment and sustainability. I can't tell you how many clients and applicants these days are thinking about, look, I, I, I want to build a career that impacts and helps and, and and supports the environment and the client or the, the climate, this major is absolutely perfect. It's dealing with that head on and offering you a chance to study the ways that you can invest in and build um, a safer, better environment for futures ahead. Of course, they've got entrepreneurship and innovation. They're one of the leading programs for marketing in the all of business schools. Um, and I don't think you normally think about Wharton when you hear the words marketing, but in fact, it's got a dynamite program. They're at the cutting edge of consumer research and data analytics. Um, so it's a super marketing program. Operations, information and decisions. So this is really that, you know, you've got the sort of the CEO who is both making the decisions and making sure as the head of the company that they're getting done. Um, and it's really both strategic and operations. They've got a major in real estate. So I bring these all up and they're, eight, you know, they're 18. So there are others that I didn't mention here. And certainly finance is one of them, but they have a lot of very distinct and well-resourced uh, majors and areas of expertise. Um, they also have the two really uh, renowned specialty programs, like to say the healthcare man management major, which is ideal for folks that are planning to go into some version of healthcare, whether it's investing or whether it's hospital management, whether it's working at a biotech. Um, and they, they also, for its Wharton MBA students, you have the chance to do a master's through the Lauder Institute in International Studies. Um, and this is a great opportunity for anybody who is looking to take their business skills um, and use them more globally or internationally. There is also a series of robust electives. And again, I think what was most pleasing to me when I really started looking at Wharton is just the, the breadth and the depth that they have and they offer their students um, when it comes to areas of academics and where to specialize. So it is finance, I'll give you that, but it's everything else too and some really superb programs um, in these areas. Okay, so it's not only finance. Let's talk about that some super competitive, uh, you know, stereotype that's out there. 
And what I would say here, so I could tell you again what my clients say, that they love it. They're having the time of their lives. They met the friends of their life. You know, they, they're just having a ball there. But I also would say, when you think about that, look at the clues. And what I mean by this is, you know, I, I think Wharton is pretty astute. They recognize that they are battling this inaccurate stereotype and they are actively seeking people who are not competitive or too focused on themselves and really focused on people beyond them. And the ways, the places that I can see that first and foremost are in the essay questions. One of the essay questions, and we'll talk about this in more detail, is ask you about how specifically you will contribute to the community, how you will help others. That does not sound very competitive, right? Um, I also will also do a preview at um, uh, around the interview, the team-based discussion that I mentioned in its very name, team-based discussion. It focuses on teams. It wants to see who you are in the team, does not want to see you as somebody who's competitive, knocking other people out of the way. And then this was another thing that surprised me. They actually created, Wharton created, was the first school to have this idea of a learning team where you are assigned with a group of classmates to a group of classmates, four, five, six, seven, whatever size team it might be, and you are given a challenge that you must solve together. Your grades are dependent on how you perform together. Um, I, as I, I was surprised to learn that Wharton was really the, the forefather of this kind of learning and is now replicated at all business schools, um, but it started at Wharton. So really, as opposed to, you know, this idea, spirit of competitiveness being in its blood, teamwork and collaboration is really in its blood, I would argue. So as I said at the beginning, the school really is trying to um, seek those that are committed to those around them as much as they are contributing or committed to their own success. It's not that they don't want ambitious and driven people, but you can be ambitious and driven and really concern yourself with those who are around you and making sure that they are advancing as well. And those are the people that Wharton, are, Wharton is looking for. Okay, so I hopefully have debunked that it's super competitive. Now let's talk about Saji. Um, and again, where I would go is just look at the evidence. And I think it seems to me every year Wharton is announcing some you know, new focus or new specialty or new, um, you know, new resource or new program for its students. They've just this past year, they focus a lot on Wharton Interactive, which um, creates and delivers gaming simulations. So a management uh, challenge, but through gaming and simu AI simulations. How cool is that? Uh, for any of you gamers out there, imagine gaming your way through part of your MBA. If you won't be doing only games, I promise you, but pretty cool for that they're at that forefront really when it comes to uh, management training. Um, I think it was like two years ago, they opened Tangent Hall, which is their center for um, innovation and entrepreneurship and venture. And they have in it the Venture Lab, which I think like they have a food innovation lab, they have maker studios. They're really trying to celebrate um, the, the culture of entrepreneurship and innovation that um, that business schools are often, you know, sometimes lagging behind industry, they're trying to get in front, which is great. And I apologize if you hear um, a dog barking in the background, that's what happens when these are live. That's my dog letting me know that someone is at, um, is uh, dropping something off. So um, they also offer a semester in San Francisco, as you may or may not know, I should have said this, Wharton is located um, in Philadelphia in Pennsylvania on the East Coast. And they recognize the draw of Silicon Valley and the educational opportunities that await there. So they have recently opened up opportunities for folks to spend a semester on the West Coast and really live and breathe the, um, the Silicon Valley vibe, if you will. Um, so that's a great opportunity. And they just have some of the coolest programs. Honestly, they have these things called ventures where you go off again in that team environment and do things like hike the Andes, um, sail tall ships, um, visit Antarctica. Um, and those are actually led by students. So not only can you as a student take advantage of one of these things, but you could actually lead one, which is really cool and really exciting. Because if you think about those times where you've grown the most, it's often when you're placed in an environment where you're uncomfortable. You're you're a little bit like nervous about whether or not you can succeed, like hiking the Andes, perhaps. And but 
through that triumph comes deeper bonds and growth. And Wharton knows that and creates that through those ventures. Then they also have these awesome GMCs, the global model modular courses where you can really study just about anything anywhere. Um, so far from Saji, I think Wharton invests a lot in its resources, again, to be at the forefront of education and to be at the forefront of the management education it gives um, its students. Um, so hopefully I have you know, debunked that. So I've told you everything that Wharton is not and given you a preview of Wharton is, but let's dig a little bit more into the stats. Um, because I think now what's important to see is like, again, it's not just finance and they're not just looking for finance, Wall Street people, you know, that, that, that sort of, again, that stereotype, they're not. Um, so this, this is all right off the, um, at least the, most of these stats, there's one stat that's not the very last stat, the, the acceptance rate. These are all right from Wharton's um, website uh, from their class of 2023. So as you can see, it's very international and diverse. 36% um, of its students are international. 83 countries are represented. Wharton made a big splash, I think it was last year or the year before, where it was the first business school, again, like the first business school to hit 50% female in its student population, which is just fantastic. Now they're up to 52%, um, which is just super because, again, you don't typically think 50% female when you're thinking finance, Wall Street, you know, you, you just have another image in your head. And um, you can see in the numbers that that is very much being challenged. Um, in terms of the prior in industry, so again, yeah, like financial services, um, private equity, VC, those are um, even investment banking is a little further down. Those are on the list as a prior industry, but so is consulting. I mean, that's a big, big one. Um, but so is government and nonprofit at 10%. 10% are coming in from technology, 5% in healthcare. You know, all I want you to take from this one is it doesn't matter if you're coming from consulting or retail. So you're, it doesn't matter if you're coming from a, a space that's well represented or underrepresented. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, there's no gaming to this. But what I will say is you will be welcome. They're, they're eager to have a different set of experiences and a robust set of experiences in the classroom. Um, that said, it's really hard to get into. So the acceptance rate, um, this is from Poets and Quants based on uh, 20 applicants in 2020. Um, it's estimated to be have about a 23% acceptance rate. I think that fluctuates a little bit year to year, depending on what's going on. So it's hard to get into. Um, the average GMAT is a whopping 733. That's high. That is, I think, probably around a 96th or 97th percentile. Um, the average GMAT two is pretty, or excuse me, GRE is high at a, not quite as high, but 162 on both the quant and verbal, the average GPA, 3.6, and the class size is just shy of 900. So it's a pretty big school, but a low acceptance rate, rate despite being such a big program and pretty aggressive stats. So, you know, I want you to look at that last box and think about, do I have these stats? If not, can I get them? So with that test score, can I get my test score up? But the rest of the stuff, know that you probably have a home because it seems to be a pretty welcoming and, um, you know, a, a curriculum and program that really is eager to have a lot of different perspective in the classroom. OK, um, a few things. So this is a little bit about what, you know, who goes. Now I want to talk about where they go afterwards. And this is actually another thing. As you're considering schools, this is a huge piece. I find that this is often underrated. And in some ways, it can be underrated for the top business schools, and you're going to be just fine. Um, but as you're considering business schools, you should always think about where am I headed and what schools can help me get there? Because that answer is not always, oh, the top five or the top 10. It might be the number two, the number eight, and the number 15 are actually the best based on your goals and where you're coming from. So I really encourage you, as you're researching what schools to apply to, to look up the placement reports from the different MBA programs to see where graduates are heading and see if how um, the school lines up with your goals. Again, it doesn't mean they have to have a ton of people going in the space you want to, but it's, it is good to know and it can be reassuring and help you make sure you're choosing the right program. So in terms of Wharton, now I think this is again from uh, Wharton's website, class of 2021, 99% received job offers, 
not too shabby. What I really was interested and in, uh, ha happy to see is 54% of the class um, was changing both industry and function. So you had some pretty bold career changers there and 54%, all right. So if you're looking to make a career switch, it, Wharton at least is gonna give you confidence that this is not their first time dealing with someone who's making a career switch and that they are, you know, they've got the resources to help you. 17% of the class changed function only and 14% changed industry only. So, and then some people stayed in the same spot, things like that, or the, you know, same job, same, same uh, uh, industry, same function. Um, but again, jobs, this is clearly a, Wharton is clearly a space that recruiters like and recruiters recognize the value of the Wharton MBA because they're willing to hire even people that are making these bold career changes, which is just super. Where to? Um, okay, so going back to it's just a finance school. If it were just a finance school, 100% would be going to finance. Finance certainly is a draw of Wharton. So, um, you know, it's it's there is a 35% that are going into financial services. So a lot of people do end up in that because again, of the strength of the program, 13% uh, go into investment banking, 11% um, go into PE and buyout, um, and then like the, the remaining go into different other, you know, investment management or even other areas within financial services. 27% go into consulting. If you're thinking about consulting or financial services, really Wharton is an absolute powerhouse. 15% are going into technology, which is super. I mean, I think it's personally I think it's great that the technology companies are more and more hiring MBAs into um, their ranks. So Amazon, Apple, you know, all the fang companies, big tech, but then also startups um, and everywhere else. You know, I, I like that they called out specifically future mobility. Um, I think there's like 2% going to the, the future mobility, which is pretty cool. So for those of you who are thinking about drone deliveries and stuff like that. Um, Warren's got some experience. Um, and the pay, nice and healthy. I mean, you know, my point is in showing this again, I don't want you to think of like, oh, I have to say I want to go into finance because look at how many people go into finance. Nope, that is actually not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying again, you can most likely find a path for you via Wharton's resources that makes sense given your career goals. I would encourage you to look at the placement report and find out, okay, have they ever sent anybody to this space I'm interested in? Probably they have. And then I want you to start looking at the resources and to understand specifically how Wharton's resources could set you up for success. But know that it's a worthwhile uh, investment. And most of the time, 99% of the time, it's going to pay off. Okay. Um, so that's it about the, uh, the path forward. So really just to recap, um, and again, like I, I feel like Wharton is just such a like strong and wide program. So you can really find your space there, which is just super. So it's really well resourced across many domains, whether you want to be a brand manager, whether you want to lead an ed tech educational technology company, whether you want to start a startup. Um, one of our colleagues actually started a venture while he was at Wharton and sold it two years afterwards um, and then built a career in venture capital and, and big tech. So, you know, it is these things are really happening at these schools. The school sees itself as a bit of a lab for its students and you can build the experience to get the learning that you need there. Um, it's very well respected by recruiters. Um, it is, you know, I mentioned the ventures and how much they really do want to see you adding value to the community. Um, and the other thing I didn't really mention, but because I think of the size and the focus on community, there are just a ton of student clubs. I was looking just to, as I was working on this presentation, like th this is just like a tiny, tiny fraction, the boxing club, the coding club, in case you want to figure out how to start coding with, co you know, there's so many tools out there where you don't need a coding background, but still need to do some coding. Um, you know, there's the investment management club, which is different than the PEVC club, which is different than the investment banking club. And then there's out for business club for different affiliations, you know, all around, designed to support its students, whatever their, their areas of interest and their goals are. So I hope that this has debunked a little bit of maybe what you 
assumed Wharton was, and that in looking at some of the truths, you could, you know, this is not to say Wharton's for everybody. You should figure out if it is the place for you. It's a bigger program. It's located in a city. Um, you know, you might want a smaller program that's rural and that's okay. But what I would say is if you don't apply to Wharton, I want it more to be based on facts and not based on stereotypes of what you've heard about it. So that's where I want you looking at the truths that we discussed and the robustness of the program and looking at the things like, um, you know, just the, the, that bar to acceptance. I mean, that's a big thing to think about when you're determining which schools to apply to. All right. So with that, if now you're like, oh, I definitely want to apply to Wharton. I definitely want to go. I want to share with you um, some information on its essays and share some tips. Um, this is really where, uh, you know, we at Gatehouse Admissions specialize. It's in the, like, working on the application. So I'm going to try to keep this quick, which is definitely not my style, but I'm going to try to keep this quick, but know that I could probably talk about this for 18 hours because this is, you know, where I spend the bulk of my time. So we're going to do this quick. So last year's essays, Wharton asked two questions. Um, the first was really, how do you plan to use the Wharton MBA program to help you achieve your future professional goals? You might consider your past experience, short and long-term goals, and resources available at Wharton, 500 words. Unofficially, we call this a what can Wharton do for you question. The second question, essay two, is taking into consideration your background, personal, professional, and or academic, how do you plan to make specific, meaningful contributions to the Wharton community, 400 words. Unofficially, we call that the what can you do for Wharton? So those are the two essays. That's it. 900 words total. Not, and they do have a word counter, so you actually really have to stay tight to that. Um, not a lot of space. What can you do with it? Well, the good news is that there are some strategies. Oh, and the thing to note here, these are last year's, we're sort of in between cycles now, last year's essay questions. Um, last year's, they tweaked that first question. It's basically the same question. They just added some more words to it um, to clarify. And the second question was the same. They, they make small tweaks in the past, say, five or so years. They've made small tweaks to the essay questions. But the idea of one being what can Wharton do for you and what can you do for Wharton have stayed pretty consistent, I think, actually, over the past 10 years. So take this with a grain of salt. These questions might change. Always, always, always go to the website. Make sure you've got the most current questions. Note that's why I put the year on here, because you might look at this a year later and think these are the questions. But I suspect even if they change, you can always be thinking, what can Wharton do for me? What can I do for Wharton? That's the mantra. So let's talk about how you can answer both of those questions, even if the wording is slightly different. Now, for the essay one, it's really interesting. They used to ask you, uh, what do you hope to gain professionally from the Wharton MBA? This year, they basically spell out what I always say is like the core ingredients to a career statement essay. They say you might consider your past experience, short and long-term goals, and resources available at Wharton. That to me, those are the three elements that any career um, or goal statement essay that a business school asks needs to address. Wharton is really cool and awesome that they called that out to you because I think a lot of people, a lot of times people don't think to mention these different aspects. But this is an equation you can use not only at Wharton, but any school that asks you about your goals and why that school. So let's see what I mean. So you're going to, I mean, it's basically just an equation. Actually, I did this as a little slide build out, but I'm just going to put them all up here. Um, is it, what you need to put forth in this essay is, the, you know, these core elements. Where have you been? The accomplishments and experience that have shaped your goals and have given you some subset of the skills you need to reach your goals. So you want to tell them where you've been. You don't necessarily have to do this in this order, by the way. Um, and then you want to help them understand where you're headed. Okay, so I'm jumping from A to C um, because it is just an equation. And if you guys have studied for GMAT, which I bet you have, or the GRE, you know you can rearrange these boxes and the because of mathematical, um, you know, with uh, theorems, I guess, or uh, properties, um, it will still work. So A, so C minus A equals B, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, you don't have to, you're building an argument here. Where you've been, been plus Wharton will equal where you're going. But you could also rearrange this when you actually write it to where you've been, where you are headed, and then what the difference is, is why Wharton. So it's, it's a very logic-driven statement. 
here's where I am, here's where I want to go. The thing that connects these two is Wharton and the resources and the programs that I'm taking, going to take advantage of. I want you guys to really like think about this equation and remember it, not just for Wharton, but for Columbia, for like so many schools, for Haas, for Stanford, for Tuck, all of these schools and more Ross, um, where else? Um, now that I said all these schools, not Kellogg so much, Booth. Um, all of these schools will ask a question that is similar to this. If you know this equation, you can answer that. What's most important is to be honest about what your goals are and then make a case for why this school's resources can help you get there. If you want more, I have an entire video just on this topic. So again, like 60 minutes, I'll be talking just about this on GMAT Club's um, YouTube channel. So you can check it out too for more to really like talk about how to sharpen your goals. What I want you guys to remember is this equation where I've been plus the school equals, equals my future, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about that second one. Unfortunately, no equation here, um, but there are some clues with the question. Taking into specific, taking into consideration, how do you plan to make specific, meaningful contributions to the Wharton community? Note the wording, specific and meaningful. So you can't just be like, oh, I'm like super excited. I'm gonna join this club and that club and. I'm really friendly and warm and there's my essay. Now, you need to be much more focused. And here are some strategies that you should keep in mind. Think expansively, but also make it relevant. I really encourage people when they think about this is, you know, remember that the classroom when you're at business school is only a small portion of how you're gonna spend your time at business school. There are clubs, there's presentations, there's learning teams, there's the time when you're outside of class. Um, how are you going to spend your time? What have you done in the past? And how might that be relevant on campus? Um, you know, uh, did, did you tutor people in finance or in statistics? Could you be a TA at school in, um, in Wharton? Or could you help your teammates in those topics? Um, maybe you, we mentioned the sailing the tall ships as one of the ventures. Maybe you are actually someone who has done a lot of boating growing up and you would actually be in a position to help lead one of those ventures. How cool would that be? So notice that those things aren't, well, there was the domain expertise with finance, but not with the sailing. It doesn't necessarily just mean what I will do in the classroom. It can mean other things too. So think expansively. But what I don't want it to be is totally irrelevant. Um, trying to think of an example like that. Just something that it has to have some manifestation of who you'll be and um, like, and what you will add to Wharton. So it's not just dropping factoids about yourself unless that, unless that factoid can really benefit your classmates somehow. Okay? Include the proof points. This is critical. For example, sometimes if I mention the tall ships and I say, I can, I, um, I, one of the ways I will contribute is by leading a um, tall ship venture. I think that would be really fun. Another way is by teaching finance. Why are you going to lead the tall ships? How is this relevant? Give them the background. I've been sailing all my life and actually just recently uh, led a small ship, uh, you know, a small sail for two weeks with four people on the, on the boat. Obviously, I'm not a sailor because I probably got all those details wrong, but you get the idea. Give them the proof. This is a, a, something we say, show, not tell. Um, and you want to just show them how you've done these things so that they believe it. Show them new things. Don't just repeat everything they just learned about you in essay one. So if you want to lead, a, um, if you're currently in financial services and you want to go start a fintech organization, don't make this essay all about your experience in financial services. They already know that from essay one. Be strategic. Keep them learning new things about you so that they are delighted and, and just keep being interested. It's not a laundry list, but, you know, it's more than one thing probably, too. Um, things to think about. These are just strategies and tips that uh, we give our clients. What will you get involved in on campus and why? Don't forget the why. Um, what perspective or expertise do you bring? And how could it be valuable? How would it inform and, you know, yeah, progress or help your classmates? Um, and then also think about areas that you want to benefit benefit from while also moving forward. Let's say you really want to explore more about fintech. So 
maybe you will go join whatever fintech club there is and really focus on fintech um, uh, solutions, international solutions. You can, that can be somewhat selfishly focused because it's an area that you want to focus on. But as long as you're helping, including others in that, that can absolutely be a way that you contribute. So when you're thinking about where, you know, what you can do for Wharton, think expansively, include those proof points, and really imagine yourself on campus. What will you do with your time and why? Okay. All right. So the, my biggest tip. All right. We're a little bit, we're going a little bit over. Um, a biggest tip for Wharton's essay is research is imperative. Start your research now. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Make sure you develop your goals for you. Don't try to write based on those stats I shared earlier. Figure out what you want to do and make a case for yourself. Imagine yourself on campus. Go a step beyond participation and involvement. I'd like to join Club X. I'm really excited about going on this. Remember, they want leaders. What is your mark going to be? What is your legacy going to be? What are you going to advance? Maybe you want to create a new venture. Maybe you want to, um, in the um, food innovation lab, you want to study uh, preservatives um, for food in ways that you can better distribute it. Whatever. Think about, be specific, and really think about what you want your legacy to be there. Okay? And remember, team, collaboration, and caring about others, too. Okay? All right. We're almost out of time, and this is way out in advance because I do want to get to your questions. But I want to preview the Wharton interview because it's cool and it's different. So Wharton uses a team-based discussion. It's known as the TBD. Not to be determined, but a team-based discussion. It was launched actually 10 years ago, and it's really unique in the, um, in the MBA application space. What it is is basically they invite. It's only by invite, and they, they will put you in a group with four or five other applicants who have also been invited to interview. They will give you a prompt and give you a challenge and give you 30 minutes, and then they will sit back and observe. So it really is, you know, it's really cool. It's awesome. I've moderated hundreds of these through the years as an admissions coach, you know, before people actually go in for the real one. And it's super, super fun to watch people work together, all strangers, exactly what you'll be doing in business school, by the way, and advance an idea um, and get through this process. It's really, really cool. I want to give you um, just a, a look at a past prompt. This was, hmm, I don't know. Five years ago, maybe four. The Ann and John McNulty Leadership Program at the Wharton School develops global leaders of diverse workforces through a distinctive co-curricular blend of coursework, coaching, and experiential learning. Students develop their personal leadership capacities, achieving tangible results with measurable global impact. Among, I've already talked about this a little bit, among the program's offerings are leadership ventures, experiences that invite participants to step out of their comfort zones, exceed their personal limitations and immerse themselves in leadership development opportunities. And then you got the prompt. For the purposes of this discussion, you've been invited to join a team tasked with developing a new leadership venture in one of three forms, expedition, intensive, or workshop. As a team, outline the purpose and structure of your venture and clearly define the measures of success. I think it's such a brilliant move of Wharton to do this because A, it's just it just it gives them a chance to do some market research. They're going to get good ideas by all your bright minds out there of how they can make the curriculum even stronger. But B, it really it replicates the experience that's going to be happening in the Wharton classroom. What better way to see how you will act on a team than putting you in a team and watching you act? Um, so it's really, really good. And so the reason I just share this is like at every step, Wharton really is focused on people who are going to be people leaders, people who care about one another, people who bring people along, that's really vital to uh, Wharton. You can tell that even by the way they conduct their interview. So if you are invited to interview, prep your, your prompt and know your pitch, know your idea. You'll get the prompt in advance. So you have some time to practice it, rehearse it. So but when you come to your um, the session with the fellow interviewees, each of you will have a moment or so to present your idea and then you're left to be. Um, go in, consider yourself a member of a team, not as an individual. One thing is, is sometimes an entire team will be invited, will be accepted. So you don't, sometimes one person in the group won't be, and it'll be that person who is like, give me, give me, give me the mic. And I want to talk. I want to talk, you know, instead of sharing the limelight too. So consider it a team effort and enjoy it. I don't know if you'll remember this by the time you get an interview uh, invitation, but maybe you will. You'll say, oh yeah, Liza was right. 
I did enjoy it. That was a lot of fun. I hope you do. All right, quickly, next steps. The big one now is um, research. Like, yeah, I spend time on the website, but do more than that. Like sign up for the marketing events. These are no brainers, but also like look, find alum, find current students to reach out to. If you're interested in the boxing club, find a member of the boxing club and connect with that person. Um, you know, it, it, the thing with technology is it makes all this stuff so much easier to do the research, do it. It will help you answer that question. What will Wharton do for me and what I will do for Wharton? You can't answer either of those questions without a lot of research, okay? That's the biggest, well, one of the biggest headlines from this presentation. Also wanna make sure you know your goals. You need to give them a, a vision for your future. Spend time understanding why you're going to business school in terms of your goals and how Wharton can help you get there. And really, quite frankly, so for those of you who are watching this, um, um, watching this live kudos to you and thank you by the way um uh we're towards the end of march I had to figure that one out uh 2022 but uh so just so you know you might be watching this a little later that's cool too but really so we're in the middle of march now people are getting started on their you know application and the reflection that's necessary for their applications now even though round one applications aren't due until um September. See, at this time of year, I'm like, what time of year it is? But so really, like, start thinking about this. Wharton will announce its questions May, June. Um, but you can do a lot of reflection now and also work on getting your resume done, do your goal development, do your research. Don't wait till May, June, because at that point, you want to be focused on essays. Um, and then, you know, obviously, we. I, I hope you can see my enthusiasm for talking about this stuff. I love it. Um, so reach out to, to us at Gatehouse Admissions to see if and how we can help. You can sign up for a free consultation um, and we can help you think through your options as well. So those are your next steps, really. The big one, everybody seems to forget, well, kind of like the first two. Research, people are like, why do I have to research? I, I just quickly looked on the web. Don't do that. Take it a step further. And number two, make sure you're investing in your goals too. Okay, really give that some thought before you just decide to have to go to business school. Really think about why and how it lines up for your goals. All right, guys, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Um, just to repeat on who um, we are for at the, um, you know, before Gatehouse Admissions, we, we love what we do and we focus really on the tippity top schools, which is one of the reasons why I'm here with you today to talk to you about Wharton. Um, we offer all sorts of ser um, services. Um, from one-on-one -on -one coaching where we go really every single step of the way to more targeted support such as mock interviews, resume overhauls, um, waitlist support, advanced planning. We'll also say, I mentioned this at the beginning a little bit, um, GMAT Club, visit. You can find the videos on their YouTube channel or right on our website. They link to the same videos. Um, where um, last year, about this time, I broke down the entire application process, not just more holistically than Wharton, but the entire business school application process into nine workshops. Um, so I encourage you, if you want to do a deep dive on that career statement I mentioned, or think more about recommenders or your resume, check that out. You can, again, you can get that on GMAT Club's YouTube channel um, or at gatehouse.com under our free resources too. So I think I'm going to take a deep breath um, and uh, see we are ready for some questions. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I will take them now. Here's one. I am in my final year of engineering and aiming to get into Wharton in the next three to four years after getting work experience. What else should I do in this time as I have average academic score and will give GMAT? Okay. Great question. First off, I love that you're asking this question now when you're still a few years out. I think um, there's no there's no one answer, but you know, definitely they will want a high GMAT. If you have time on your side, get a high test score. There is no reason not to. Um, like, I mean, I'm, obviously, I make that sound easier. I know it's a ton of work, but there are so many resources out there, like GMAT Club, that will help you get that score you need. Um, get the GMAT or the GRE out of the way um, earlier on, well before you're starting your application. Honestly, get it out like get it out of the way now-ish um, because it just gives you more time to worry about everything else rather than worrying that maybe that the GMAT's going to hold you back. That's number one. And then number two, I would say 
Another area where I see people are just kind of short is on everything else. Um, you know, again, I, I, it goes back to a little bit about what I said of like, yes, the MBA program is in the classroom, but it's so much more and you need to be so much more than your job too. So invest in the things that you love doing and think about ways that you can extend your involvement in them to be meaningful to other people. Keep going back to the boxing um, because I saw it was a club and I thought that was interesting. Maybe you love boxing. Um, maybe this next stage you learn some sort of like martial arts and teach self-defense to kids. Um, you know, maybe you, um, you know, I don't know, build teams to that compete for charity. Um, if you are, if you were a mentor or you um, were a TA, maybe you start doing more formal tutoring of children. Think about what you love and you're passionate about how to extend it in ways that you can continue to challenge yourself. This might sound obvious, but also the two other things is like do a really good job at work because you are going to need recommendations and make sure that you maintain relationships with your managers. It's a way off. I don't have any idea who you're going to ask, but you want to make sure that you've got some options. And so, you know, bosses can be tough. Look, it's tough to work for somebody else, um, but kind of see through that. Make sure you kind of keep those relationships warm because you might need to lean on that person later. So I think that's it. Um, okay. Jenny, I got... LLM admission, I don't know what LLM means, as a matter of fact, from Northwestern and Cornell and are going to prepare for getting an MBA recently. So I'm wondering if my, I actually have no idea what LLM is. That tells you how much my little world of MBA is. So Jenny, if you could, if we could clarify what LLM is, is it law? I don't know. I'm going to be like, oh, that, of course, I should have known, but I don't know what LLM is. John, can I apply without work experience? So a number of the schools do have um, programs designed for people to apply to when they're still in college. These are sometimes referred to as deferral, early, I think, early applicant. Um, or, um, you know, two plus two, that's Harvard's program, Rising Scholar. It's kind of these clever ways. Some of the schools include Harvard. I, I, like a lot of them offer it now. I think, you know, the schools recognize that, you know, they, as, as, as much as we don't think about it, the business schools are businesses too. They are eager for bright, awesome students and they want to pluck off the bright, awesome students um, so they don't lose them to another school. So I think what the schools realized it used to be just Harvard and Stanford that offered these um, programs for people to apply to um, directly from school while they were still in college. Now, like, I think a lot of like Wharton offers it, MIT Sloan, Yale, B Booth. Um, I think Kellogg does too. Like a lot of programs do. Um, but it's not for immediate matriculation. So you basically apply now in your senior year, your last year of university, um, but you don't actually go to school for another like two, three or four years. It depends on the school. They all have different, um, you know, specifics. I think the only program, the, the, the only way to go without experience, I think there are two options. One, I think Yale's, I think it's called Silver Scholars Program. It basically, go, you, you would, you're in your final, final year of university, you do one year in the MBA program, then go work for a year and then go back. I think that's how it works. So that one's a little bit, you get a, um, you know, you, you get a little bit of work experience in the program. The other option is there are some, you know, management degrees for people that go right um, out of college, but they're not the equivalent of an MBA. I know Duke has one, Ross has one. Um, so this is almost like a one-year master's program that you'd stick on top of your university degree. It's still a great degree, but it's not the equivalent of an MBA. In general, the master's of business administration, it is designed for people that have professional experience. Some of the reason is that so much of the learning comes from your peers and not, you know, not the, 
not the lecture, not the problem sets. It comes from the learning that your peers around you have had. So they really do want you to have experience so you have something to add. Any tips for Camilla? Any tips for international an international application? Camilla, everything really still stands. Um, you, you know, I think my biggest advice for an international applicant is be who you are. Um, you don't need to be American to get into a, a U.S.-based business school. You don't need to sound like an American. You don't have to look, feel like an American, whatever that is, you know, to, to get into one of these programs. Um, so don't try to be. So beyond that, everything else st stays the same. The schools are interested in people who have um, leadership, demonstrate leadership potential, who have made an impact in their world for the people around them, as well as for themselves, who have, who have strong smarts um, and analytics, um, who live bold, creative, interesting lives. Um, but that doesn't really matter where you are. I, I don't know if that's it's such a kind of a broad thing, but I think the big thing is, look, like, you know, as you saw the stats, like, what was it, 23%? 33%, 33% of Wharton's classes international, maybe 23%, I might be forgetting. They're eager to have folks from across the world in their program. So embrace that, you know, and, and sometimes people are really nervous about um, if English isn't their first language, that's okay too. Like definitely like your, your essays shouldn't be the same as someone who grew up speaking English. It just makes sense. So you don't, don't worry about it and, and almost don't try to make it sound like it is. Be yourself. Um, obviously, you don't want blatant errors, but uh, you kind of what 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 a, sort of someone who grew up speaking English might say, "Oh, that's a weird wording," um, but but that it, it's not. It, it, it's you, and it, it totally works. So um, I think that's the biggest thing um, for recommenders. Check the schools. Um, sometimes that can be hard if your recommenders don't speak English and therefore don't write in English. But a lot of them allow translation, so just check that out too. Um, you obviously have to um, write everything in English and you do have to take your TOEFL. The one thing I didn't realize, um, you know, again, this was earlier in my career. Um, I ha was working with a client who was working for years in the UK, but he had been educated in France um, and was French, um, you know, born, born and spent his, um, his up through like 20s in France. But then he'd been working in the UK for like four or five years and he was still required to take the TOEFL. So that's the other thing, just that that kind of burned both of us. It was bad. It was bad time. You had to rush to take it. Um, so make sure you take the TOEFL if you need to. Just check the school's requirements. They're really good. If you've got any questions, you can, you can always reach out to the schools too. I hope that helps, Camilla. Does the average increase for those pursuing deferred programs since we have no work experience? <sighs> Not really. So I think what you mean is like, are the test scores or the stats even higher? Not really, but sort of. Um, I think what happens is it, it, they're probably roughly the same. I know HBS re once released that their GMAT was the same. The average GMAT of the, those that were accepted in the two plus two program was the same as the rest of the class. But I would say the two plus two or deferral program, um, it is just by its nature incredibly uh, like ambitious. So what you do have is an absolute pool of superstars. So it doesn't, it, it just means like, when you're applying for the normal program, the reason why it's all superstars is you gotta be that much more ahead on your game and know what you want and like, just have everything, all, all your ducks in a row and have all your plans figured out to know that you should apply for these things. And so just, it's usually those persons that, you know, class president, head of the class, like you name it, they have a ton of leadership, a ton of excellence and, um, commitment and and just you know uh, really really stellar performers at everything they've touched. So what that just means is that the element of luck becomes, I think, an even more. This is my way of thinking it. Um, if you think about the two the regular two two year program, maybe like sixty percent of applicants are qualified for any of the programs, and after that, it just becomes a little bit of like I don't know. We have sixty like. Out of 10, so HBS has 10,000 applicants, 6,000 are more than qualified to be here. We can have a class of 1,000. Oh, let's just start picking. Like, kind of that's how hard it is sometimes. Imagine for the deferral program, I don't know the numbers of how many applicants they received 
let's assume it's 2000, maybe 1900 are qualified and yet they can only accept like one or 200. So it just, like that's bad math there. I, what I would say is like the acceptance rate is, is the same. The averages are the same, but the pool itself, it's just that, that element of luck because you're playing at such a high league and there are so few spots, chances even more um, prevalent at that stage. I hope that works. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, and you still do need a lot of leadership. Grace, TBD sounds quite challenging. It's not. Well, number one, if you get to the interview, definitely take advantage of a mock interview. Work with Gatehouse, like you work with uh, lots of people offer them. As I said, I've moderated, I don't know, like a hundred over the years. Um, I'll tell you again how long I've been doing this for. Um, but you know, they're, they're super fun. But I do um, really suggest a mock interview for Wharton specifically, because I feel like there's all this anxiety going in. And then they, what I always hear is clients go in, they're like, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know how I should act. And then they come out and they're like, oh, oh, I get it. Okay. I just have to be myself. And, and maybe I'll tweak this a little bit when I go in for the real one, but Grace, it's actually not quite, it's not challenging. You should, you do need to prepare your pitch. Um, but they're really, evaluating you, are you a good team player? That's what the crux of it is. Uh, and I suspect you are, but I would say to take to, if you get to that point and you're invited to interview, do a mock interview for Wharton specifically, just to like get over that fear, because once you've done it, then you'll be that much better for the real one. Is our, Grace, is R1 applying, is round one better applying, um, <laughs> is applying round one better than applying in round two? It depends. So all else being equal, if your application is as strong and your essays and your test score and your recommendations, if your application is as strong in round one versus round two, then I would say, yes, you should apply in round one. Only because we never will have inside information for any one person which round was actually better. Um, we'll just never know that. It's impossible. The schools don't know that until they get the applications. And then only then will they know, okay, like how many applications do we have? How many consultants do we have? How many of this? You know, it's impossible to know. So all else being equal, I would always say round one because it's a clean slate. However, if your application is going to be stronger in round two, go for round two. There, there are people who get in round two, lots of people, hundreds of people who get in in round two actually Tomorrow, I think, to, uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, I think Kellogg and Wharton announce round two decisions, Thursday booth. I think Thursday actually will start informally telling people tomorrow, I think, and then next week, Harvard and Stanford. And then the following week, Sloan, Sloan, my alma mater always likes to be a little late and different. They're cool like that. Um, you know, we definitely have clients who applied in round two. We have clients who will be successful in round two. It, it um, so, if you have something that you need to, you know, test score isn't high enough, you scrambled too much on your application for round one, um, you're getting sometimes like a promotion is worth waiting for. It depends what it is. Um, go for round two. But all else being equal, round one is better or, or not better, but you can never know. So your odds are there, like without knowing, given it's a blank slate. I would just always kind of feel better about getting in round one if it's as strong as it would be in round two in terms of your app. Michael, I am applying for schools for the September 2022 application cycle. Do some elite schools accept an application submission with a GMAT school score following in April? Reason is test centers cut since COVID-19 in Zambia. Um, So Michael, so, so I'm not 100% sure. I don't know test centers cut in Zambia. I don't know if they're open now or not, or if they're not open until next year. So you you only need the GMAT for the, like for um, most schools, you just need the GMAT to take the GMAT before the deadline. So the deadline is September you know, for most schools, as long as you've taken that GMAT for like a week, some schools it's even the day before, you're fine. Um, some schools will even let you in a week or two after the deadline. You should always, always, always clarify that with every school 
because it's a, an exception, not the rule. Um, they might accept a GMAT like two weeks after. Um, some schools are also, they are, they're not requiring the GMAT anymore. Uh, Ross, um, Ross, Darden, I think MIT Sloan, Ross and Darden, their rationale is somewhat open, I think, or at least I know Ross's is. I know Sloan, it, it is like at this point, at least last year, I think it was more they would accept if, it, if you couldn't take it because of COVID. So you might be able to get a test waiver. I don't know if, say, you applied in September 2022. Uh, unless you mean, uh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure, sure if you mean you applied and you're going to be starting in round one. But... um or in, in the fall, but I don't think they would accept you apply in September and then you're not submitting a GMAT for several months afterwards. But my biggest advice is check with the school, check the school. Look, they, they understand the situation and they also understand that even with the at home option, it's not always feasible for people, you know, that the internet might not be stable or, you know, it's, it's um, difficult to get quiet time in the house. They totally get that. So just reach out to the schools and ask what their specific guidance is. Um, they have gotten certainly more flexible um, in the past two and a half years that or two years than they were before. But you should check with each of them. All right, you guys. Awesome. I appreciate all the questions. I give stars for gold questions or give out gold stars for questions. So each of you guys who ask questions, really, really appreciate it. Definitely reach out to me at gatehouse.com. Um, you can uh, submit a form for a free consultation and check out Wharton. It's an awesome school. And if you say no to it, by all, that's fine. Just make sure you're saying no to the right reason. But maybe this gave you a new way to look at it. So thanks again, everybody. Um, and I'll see you at the next one of these whenever it might be. Thanks. <laughs>